This episode is brought to you by Wear Buff, your go-to for Buffalo-inspired apparel. Get your hands on stylish t-shirts, hoodies, and more at wearbuff.com. That's W-E-A-R-B-U-F dot com. And make sure you use the promo code TWB at checkout for 10% off your first order. Stay Buffalo proud with Wear Buff. With training camp right around the corner, we're going to look at some of my favorite positional battles on the offensive side of the ball this week on the Wandering Buffalo podcast. And now listening to the Wandering Buffalo podcast with your host, Justin Gottard. Bills Mafia, welcome into another episode of the Wandering Buffalo podcast, a show on the Buffalo fan base podcast network. My name is Justin, and I will be your host today. And this show is brought to you by Wear Buff. Um, awesome t-shirts, hoodies, hats, all kinds of stuff going on over there. New designs coming out all the time, so make sure you're checking out Wear Buff. Um, we have links to Wear Buff right on our website, wanderingbuff.com. Also, some off-season articles we've been working on, um, some other stuff on there, highlight videos, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so make sure you're checking those out. Today we are going to start talking training camp, and I know we're in the part of the off season where everything feels so far away. Uh, we're kind of in the dog days where nothing's really happening. You know, we basically have the roster set. We've talked about the roster. We've seen projected depth charts. We've seen the projected cuts. We've done the projected cuts. Um, this is the time of the year where you pretty much don't want to see your team in in the headlines at all because nothing really happens transaction wise or anything like that. You end up this time of the year getting you know who's getting in trouble and things like that. Um, you know off season training injuries, uh, but no real like roster changes. You know pretty much until we get into training camp and we start seeing you know some live reps happen. Uh, that being said, it does still feel so far away, but. Training camp is right around the corner. We're, you know, just a couple weeks out um, from the Bills opening up training camp. Um, I will say the training camp at Fisher and Rochester, I will be in attendance on the 25th. Um, so see me, say hi to your boy, um, be watching, hanging out. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're we're about two weeks away from that. Um, so I wanted to kind of take the time to start looking at some of the position battles. Um, this week, I'm going to talk on the offensive side of the ball. Um, next week, we'll cover the the defensive side of the ball. And what I think is is kind of fun about doing that this exercise this year is we actually have like a decent amount of overturn on the roster. Uh, yes. Tons of players still coming back, you know, pretty obvious starters and depth in a lot of positions. Uh, but kind of for like the last four ish years, pretty much as long as I've been doing this podcast, um, we've been pretty well running it back with the same team. And we see like all the core guys, um, the Trey Whites, the Poyers, the Hydes, these, these guys that are going to be you know absent from the team now um that a lot of the position battles weren't all that interesting it was kind of more like can this draft pick slot in and make an impact and you know attacking one position or you know taking big swings in free agency um this year is to me a lot different of a feel and some of these camp battles are interesting to me now but they're kind of more interesting as we go forward and and hopefully as I get into it that'll that'll kind of make sense um but just going to kind of dive right in the quarterback position no intriguing (laughs) training camp battles here um I, I guess maybe throughout the preseason do we see anything from Shane Buchel that he could be you know a long term number two at I don't see that being the case. I think Mitch Trubisky is pretty locked in there. You brought him in to to have that role. And Shane Buchel's kind of been 
his career has been, you know, third string practice squad, emergency quarterback type of guy. Um, so I don't see anything really intriguing there. Um, in the running back room, kind of the same story, but a little bit more interesting to me. And this one is more with the future implications. And obviously the room right now, the top three, James Cook, Ty Johnson, Ray Davis. And where this is interesting to me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out there way in advance, I am not looking forward to Bill's Twitter, Bill's social medias when James Cook contract comes up, um, especially if he has you know a similar year to this year. Um, the whole debate of paying running backs, all that, it, it's going to be a tough conversation, um, especially with the team that's been pretty tight against the cap. Um, but I think something that could influence decisions when that contract comes up is kind of what we see from the running back room in this coming season. Um, and not so much Ty Johnson, um, the greater extent being Ray Davis. And if he looks like he could kind of take over as a full-time back, um, I think Ty Johnson was great last year in limited touches. Um, I, I think he's a great compliment back, but looking at who is going to be that, you know, quote unquote bell cow back for this team, is it James Cook going forward? Is Ray Davis able to show enough this year that, you know, uh, Cook's contract comes up and you feel okay moving on? Um, I think that's going to be a really tough conversation just because of the level of production Cook has had and kind of like the the speed, the explosiveness, the all kinds of stuff that we see from Cook that we haven't really had in the running back room since I'm Shady. And who knows? This year I think is going to be really important for Cook. Uh, just looking at last season, you know, the uptick in the the number of touches that he took compared to the rest of his career going back to college. Um, kind of, you know, teetered off at the end of the season a little bit was that, you know, from just wearing down from usage is Ray Davis able to come in and just automatically be that compliment back? Or are we looking at more of a Ty Johnson situation? Um, I'll say this is, this is really interesting to me because you, you did invest pretty meaningful draft capital into Ray Davis, um, at least as far as running backs go. And with the skill set of James Cook and some of his production and, you know, despite his drops last year, his calling card kind of being as a receiving back, um, just that combination of skill set, he's likely going to be set to get a, a pretty big payday in free agency. Um, and when you're talking, you know, 10, 11, 12 million dollars per year for a running back. And we see how that's kind of worked out across the NFL. It's not really something a ton of teams do. Um, I don't know what's going to happen there. I think it's going to be interesting. And I, I will say personally, for me, this will probably end up being one of the harder discussions that I've had on the show because I'm, I'm going to be fighting with myself. Um, because as a as a fan, I love James Cook. He's the type of dude I would want to keep around. I, I think you you know get a compliment back. Maybe it'll be Ray Davis that can take a little bit of the load off of his shoulder, do some of the short yardage stuff, um, and I think you can have a productive running back for for a good long while. Um, so I, I have that, which is going to be at constant odds with my you know, my team building philosophy, and, and that would be never paying a running back a second contract. Um, I think the running backs do definitely matter, um, but I think there's guys coming out in the draft every year. We've seen teams, you know, replace these high-level running backs with, you know, free agents on one, two-year deals for like $2 million per year. 
um, and they're able to come in and be productive. I think it does matter who your running back is, but it, it matters more who the guys are in front of them and the scheme. And I think the Bills have been developing in that so that they could they can kind of slot in the next guy. Um, but like I said, that that's going to be a really tough conversation for me because I, I am not on team run, pay running backs. Um, but being, being a fan in the moment, it, it's really hard to, uh, not, not get emotionally in, involved with it. Um, so that'll be interesting for me going forward. Um, maybe there's another edition next year. We'll see. Uh, I'm really excited to see Ray Davis in preseason. We got some other guys in the mix, Darrington Evans, Frank Gore Jr. They're going to get a, a ton of work during the preseason. Uh, so maybe they can, you know, flash some skills, flash some tools that, that might make them some sort of option in the room going forward as well. Uh, the tight end room, not much intriguing me here. I think you're your top three here in Kincaid, Knox, and Q Morris, I'd I'd put that right up there with, you know, most teams in the league. I'd say it's probably better than most teams in the league. Um, and then, you know, you got a couple of guys on the practice squad that are probably tight end three in most rooms. Um, so I, I feel good about the tight end room. There's not much I'm watching for as, as we go through training camps. I, I guess I'll throw in there um, Kincaid heading into year two. Um, just he had an awesome rookie year and just kind of seeing the steps towards what next year is going to look like. Um, watching for help in that room. Um, but other than that, not too much crazy going on in the tight end room. The other really interesting room to me is the wide receiver room. And at least offensively, I think this is kind of, I guess the room where you'll see all kinds of prognostication and guessing and prediction on who's going to make the team. And really when I'm looking at it right now, I have Coleman, Shakir, Curtis Samuel and Matt Collins as as roster locks. Um, I think something dramatic would have to happen, um, perhaps an injury, for one of those guys to not make it. And Matt Collins is the one where I've had some discussions where I, I've gotten pushback about like, oh, Matt Collins as a roster lock before MVS and. I think that what Matt Collins brings to the team special teams wise um, from a leadership perspective, he's been a captain of special teams. Um, I think that's going to be valuable to the team. And we're talking kind of like the tail end of the depth chart receiver. This guy is not going to get 120 targets. Uh, he's going to be a role player on offense and contribute on special teams. Um, so I think he's pretty locked in. That's where it kind of gets interesting of rounding out the room of, first of all, how many receivers do <clears throat> do the Bills end up keeping? Um, typically, it's been six. I believe last year it was five. Um, and that would leave either one or two players from the remainder, Chase Claypool, MVS, Justin Shorter, KJ Hamler, Isabella, Tyrell Shavers, Brian Thompson, Lauren Keyes, and Xavier Johnson. Um, I think the pretty obvious, you know, easy answer is we round out the room with five and six being Claypool and MVS. And I think Claypool in particular is very interesting here uh, just because of what he's been able to be in the league and what his last two years have been and you know he's looked he's looked great in the offseason you know OTAs and whatnot you know shorts and t-shirt running against air um saying all all the right things in the press conferences and it's hard for me not to not to let myself buy into the hype 
of, you know, this guy, former second round pick, um, to the Steelers. And for what it's worth, the Steelers don't miss on receiver. Um, super productive in Pittsburgh and then just turned into a dumpster fire somehow. Um, so if we're able to regain, you know, even, you know, like a majority of that, I think Claypool's really, really interesting in the mix. Um, that being said, we've also seen the past two years of who he is. And, you know, <laughs> there's a world where I can look at this depth chart and be like, yeah, Claypool could end up being a wide receiver three or four if he's who he was in Pittsburgh. Um, there's also a situation where I could very easily be like, yeah, Claypool got cut. Not surprised, no big deal. It was you know, kind of a nothing investment. Um, so he's the most interesting to me. Um, MVS, kind of a similar situation to me um, in a very different way. We know he brings the speed element, but we've also seen him have issues with drops. Um, and with the room behind him, I just, I can't put him in as a lock. Uh, I know... A lot of people are like, yeah, he's the field stretcher that we didn't have. He's got the 4-3 speed. We have other guys on the team that have 4-3 speed. Um, Curtis Samuel um, and Shakir, both right up there. Um, So I don't think it's necessarily a spot that's like, oh, you can take the top off of defense, so here's your roster spot. Um, I think those guys exist, and especially when we're hearing the messaging from the Bills being, you know, everybody's going to eat. Some weeks this guy might go off. Some week that guy might go off. Um, For that philosophy to work, you're going to need a blended set of skills. Uh, You're going to need a blended set of skill sets um, to be able to accomplish a system like that. And... I do think MVS makes the team. Kind of just, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody else was able to make enough noise and the Bills see MVS as kind of a one-trick pony type deal and they want more. Um, Justin Shorter in the mix. I'm interested to see what he looks like throughout you know, training camps, preseason games. Um, I think for him to be able to make the roster, we would need to see his special teams really cleaned up. Um, You're talking the tail end of the depth chart. You got to be able to contribute there. And last we saw that, he he was kind of a mess. Um, I'm always interested in Shorter because, you know, he's built like a freaking god um you know the skills are there but he's kind of somebody that throughout his career thus far including college has kind of been like an underachiever um it's not to say that you know it's impossible for you know the light to flick on all all the circuits to connect and you know he blows up um so he's somebody that like as long as he's in the building I'll be keeping a, an eye on him, but I'm not overly optimistic. Um, Andy Isabella, I think, is always an interesting name. I don't see a world where he makes the roster just based on last year. Um, there's times the Bills were struggling for more from the receiver room. Um, there's injuries, and people were calling for him, and we just... We never really saw him do anything last year, and I, I think if if there was a situation where he was going to make it happen, it, there was the opportunities there last year. Um, and th- this again, a guy with some draft pedigree, but he's he's been with teams that had you know room for somebody to walk in and and be that guy. And it's it's just never happened for him in his career. So working his way from the practice squad, can he crack the roster? Maybe 
have some return duties that, you know, eke him in, maybe. Um, if anybody's going to do that, I think it's more the next guy, and that's KJ Hamler. Um, very, very similar in how I would describe him as Isabella. You know, super fast, little twitchy guy. Um, he's had some success in the NFL. He's had a career that's been riddled with injuries and you know if he can stay healthy and put it together maybe he can eke out that last receiver spot and again contribute on special teams return duties something of that nature um and then behind Hamler just kind of a group of guys that have you know some of them have been around for a while on the practice squad some of them are new additions to the team um but all guys that I would be surprised if they made the roster. Um, I guess maybe my my one exception there would be Tyrell Shavers. Um, he's made some noise in the preseasons before, kind of been that that preseason hero that we often have, and you know the Brandon Rileys and and those type of guys. Um, yeah, it's really the, the that fifth and sixth spot, mostly the sixth spot that I think is really intriguing. And, you know, for what it's worth when it comes to the actual football games, your wide receiver six isn't doing a ton to, to really turn the tide in games. Um, but me personally, I'm like a roster construction dork. I love that. Um, and kind of like, looking at how it all works out and where the depth is if we have a rash of injuries and, you know, seeing what guys that we, you know, might have signed as undrafted guys or they've been on the practice squad for a, for a couple of years, um, seeing kind of these developmental pieces and where they're at and, you know, if we think they can take the next step and, you know, some of these guys take three, four years on the practice squad and, and come up and, We've seen that with the Bills in guys like Cam Lewis and possibly Jamarcus Ingram this year um, who kind of do their time on the practice squad. They soak in everything they learn and they end up on, on the roster. Um, and it's guys that were, you know, two, three years ago afterthoughts. Um, so the the preseason, the training camps, all that, I know a ton of people like can't wait to get through preseason. I love preseason. I love seeing these guys play. Um and, and seeing what the depth of the team looks like because hopefully you get into the season you, you never really have to know what the depth looks like. Um, then we're going to wrap it up here on the offensive line and I don't think there's any like super obvious battles on the offensive line. Um, obviously you lose Mitch Morse this year and that seems like it was a really intentional move because um, you didn't have to. And you now have David Edwards slotted in at the left guard, McGovern sliding over to center. Um, I think your 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 two ends are absolutely locked in with Dawkins and Spencer Brown. Um, Osiris Torrance had a great rookie year. I think he's very solidly locked in there. Um, but then the Bills go out and draft. Cedric Van Perren Granger and I think that kind of does give the ability to to shake up the interior of the offensive line and David Edwards is somebody that I was excited that we brought in um he's got a history with Cromer he's got starting experience but he hasn't really started much in the last couple of years and you know, now you're moving McGovern over to center. He's talked a lot about, like, how it feels like home, how it's more his natural position. Um, but then you go and draft a VPG. Um, I think McGovern was pretty great at guard last year. So, you know, maybe there's a world where VPG is, you know, showing out in the offseason into preseason games and kind of makes it impossible to leave him on the bench. Maybe it's something that, you know, happens throughout the season. Um, maybe McGovern stays at center and 
they work VPG in a card. Maybe David Edwards takes the job and he's excited he's starting again. He never lets it go. Um, but I think the combination of those three players is is pretty interesting. And I think you have a, a good mix of talent there and some positional versatility. Um, that you could get somebody that you're comfortable with at center and have one of the others go to guard. And I don't, I don't really know how much that combination would make a difference. Um, the one thing I will say about the the center position and having VPG be, be a rookie and like, would he come in day one and start? I don't think that's likely. And I think the biggest reason there would be you know, how much the center works with the quarterback for, you know, calling out alignments, calling out defenses, um, matchups against the offensive line. Um, I, I think people really underestimate just how much the centers do for quarterbacks in that regard. Um, so I think if VPG were to crack the lineup, it would be, you know, a situation where you're comfortable with him starting at left guard and you know, David Edwards being, you know, the six man again type deal. Um, and honestly, would, would we really be surprised if another change happened at left guard? Um, there's been a turnstile of players there next to Dawkins, like his whole career, um, just kind of trying to get the right mix. So if, if something were going to, you know, change, I don't hate the idea of, you know, a rookie that ends up getting slotted in there playing between McGovern and Dawkins. Um, so I think that could be an interesting combo that maybe we see some work there and and he's able to, you know, kind of make an impact that shows us that he can be an answer um, looking into the future. Um but that's what that's all I got for position battles on the offensive side of the ball that I'm interested in. Uh, make sure you drop me a comment. Let me know if you think I'm way off base on something. If there's other battles that you're more interested in, um, something that I've completely missed. Drop a comment. Let me know. Um, I do appreciate you following us and tuning in for this episode. Uh, off season. Talk about it pretty often here. It gets kind of wacky. Um, Bills are on vacation. We're taking our vacation, so scheduling might get a little bit weird. We try to stay as consistent as we can for you. Um, easy way to make sure you never miss an episode. Make sure you're subscribed so you always see us when we come out. Um, do appreciate if you like, share, tell a friend about the show if you're enjoying it. Um, like I said, we're coming up on the training camp, and I will be there on July 25th. Um, look for me. Say hi if you see me. Um that's going to do it for this week's episode, and as always, go Bills.